filmmaking obviously is about two things. One is about storytelling, and the other one is about the audience. Well, we'll make it really simple because both of those things have been completely impacted by technology and the internet and the change in behavior that this has brought. So both the storytelling is changing, technology is changing, and of course the audience, the, the users are changing. So Marshall McLuhan, who is the original futurist, you know, really bright guy who studied media, he said it's a framework that changes, not the picture. So if we're looking at the future of cinema, the future of films, we can't talk about you know having a Facebook page or distributing on Twitter or using YouTube. Those are just pictures. Those are just tiny pieces. We have to look a little bit larger because that's what's going to be important. Basically, what we're seeing right now with the iPad and other devices, you guys know the iPad, yes? Who has an iPad? Okay, I have an iPad, sorry. <laughs> so, not to promote the iPad, but it shows, in fact, I don't want to promote the iPad at all. It's too expensive. But what it does, it has given us an interface revolution. An interface is how we use machines, right? So if we're looking at the example here of Wired Magazine, Now there's 27 companies, electronic companies, that make devices that are building iPads. The iPad is, I don't know, 800 francs or something. I live in Basel, by the way. Just forgot to say, I don't live in America. Uh, not very far. But the iPad is about 800 francs, but you'll have devices made by Samsung and by Dell. Some of them will cost $50. Uh, very cheap, especially in Asia, devices that do this. The big difference is that you can touch it, and it does something. You don't have to be a computer person. In fact, these aren't computers. Right? They're just the devices where you can read and browse and watch. This is the important part. Right? The amount of stuff that people have watched on the iPad has already been for the last uh, six weeks that they've sold three million of these. Right? And sometimes about 20% of the entire traffic in America is taken up by the iPad, internet traffic. So those people are consuming, consuming, showing, using media. They're buying stuff too. And they're also producing on this, which I'll show you shortly. So this is a big change in terms of interface. I'm going to give one to my mother, who's 75 years old. Okay, the neighbor has internet connection. And I would anticipate that she's going to watch television and movies on the iPad rather than, you know, in bed, for example, rather than in the living room. It's laid out. Uh, exactly. This is a service called Netflix. Anybody know Netflix? In America, it's a fantastic service. It's $10 a month. You can order as many DVDs as you want, and they rotate. So you can always have one DVD and then the next one. And now Netflix is giving you free streaming, on-demand streaming, of all of the films when you're a subscriber. Uh, if you know the trick, you can get it from here, too. But uh, right now, it's not available officially in Switzerland. It's $10 a month, right? But it's fantastic service, and what Netflix has done is putting the Netflix service onto the iPad. You're going to see the future, the future will be to do this kind of thing, but we don't pay. That's even better. Right? Why won't we pay? Because there'll be so many advertisers and brands and companies like Swisscom and others who want to reach us and give us extra services, that this will be bundled. We'll actually get a lot of these services for free, parenthesis, we're paying, paying with attention. It, it's laid out exactly like you would stream Netflix from your uh, home computer with the ability to cycle through, no, it's not, there we go. With the ability to cycle through all of the- 22 movies, million subscribers the ability in America. To watch any of them. So uh, the, the greatest test, I think, for this kind of an application and how well it streams is to play. Not a very good review, the guy's kind of bored. Which I decided just to test it out before I. Uh, yes, you should have. But in any case, so this shows it's basically the idea of a jukebox, a cinema in the sky. Right? And that is the idea that we're going to have. This is the idea that we had, of course, 10 years ago, the beginning of the internet. 
didn't quite work out. For example, in music, mp3.com. And if any of you are into music, you may know a service called Pandora. Pandora is a music service that has currently 42 million subscribers. Where you type the name of an artist, and it will make a playlist based on the artist and the keyboards. It's free. 42 million subscribers. So you can anticipate the future of everything that we do, music, films, books, banking, education, is moving into the cloud, it's moving into the sky. And this will be a fantastic development, both for us as creators and as users. For the industry, it won't be quite as easy. Right? Because as you can imagine, what happens here is it's easy to connect. I was saying earlier, when you're a filmmaker, it's about the story and it's about the audience. Everything in the middle is going to be redone. Right? And that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing this shift. You know, we used to think of the internet as being for geeks and freaks and, you know, Americans. Um, well, not, not that that's the same thing, really, but... Anyway, so, about computers. Right? It's about computers, but this box here isn't going to be the way that people watch movies, right? Not in Brazil, India, Russia, China, Europe, you know, wherever. I mean, this is... it's a work machine, right? Movies isn't about work, right, so that won't work. It'll be all moving to mobile devices. I don't know if you know these numbers, right, but there's about 2 billion people connected to the internet. Maybe about 600 million are actually on fast internet, so they can do this. But there's 4.1 billion people on mobile phones. Here, our neighbor, Italy, right, 145% penetrations. That means people have two phones. So you can bet how these people are going to watch movies. They may not watch it always on the phone because it's obviously very small. But the phone is the control. The control for what they like, what they save, what they use, how they pay. They may transfer it later, which I'll talk about. But basically this is going to happen. The internet is moving into mobile devices. Switzerland, for example, is the world's most expensive country for phone calls and data. Right? That's because we're all, you know, we, we're not so averse to paying yet, you know, we still put more money. So what's happening around the world, in Indonesia, for example, where I have some clients, beautiful place, the cheapest phone calls in the world are in Indonesia and in India. So now you're going to see people in Indonesia, 280 million people, they're all getting wireless internet. So they did not have radio before, they did not have television before, some of those islands. Now they can go online and watch YouTube. Not very soon. Maybe they'll watch your stuff, right? It brings us back to the audience. So the big deal is, in mobile devices, uh, it's, that's where it all starts, is the idea of saying, okay, they're personal, they're always on, they're social, we can share stuff, location of where. Uh, there has been a study in China showing that the average person uh, about 75% of the average people don't have the mobile phone more than one meter away. Right? So, in 65% of people have said they would never borrow a mobile phone to somebody else, their mobile phone. So, the mobile phone is becoming a very powerful mechanism. Not so much for the watching, which is getting better, but yeah, it's small, obviously. But in Korea, for example, you have people projecting from the mobile phone. You know, you have kids in the subway projecting to the wall from the phone. Right? So, like, I'm sure you've seen kids in the subway play music, you know, which sounds terrible too. But now they're sitting around in the subway projecting onto the wall, having a screening of a movie. Right? And this is, I mean, projectors now, like, you can con uh, connect a projector to the iPhone, it's $100 for the projector. So that technology is coming very quickly. Then we're seeing this trend around the world as people are saying, well, if I want to watch a movie, I'm going to use whatever screen is available. So if I'm in the car, I use the screen in the seat. On the mobile phone, I use the mobile screen. I use my wristwatch, my eyeglasses, television, whatever is there. And that is a trend that we're going to see. People say, well, I don't really care. Whatever, whatever is the best thing I have at this moment. But they want to make sure that they have all of their content available, all of their movies. And so they don't care so much about the screen, they care much more about the content. A lot has been said about 3D, right? I'm sure you're interested in 3D. 
Uh, I saw almost all of the 3D movies because my kids forced me. I think it's pretty cool, but you know, I don't see the big difference here, <laughs> you know, in terms of the mechanics or so. You know, it's one of those things where we've gotten the message from Hollywood that we should all love 3D and pay more. But I'm not so sure, you know. So I think it's a trend that's clearly going towards digital theater, better sound, 3D, all the extra stuff. But does it make a fundamental difference? I'm not sure. I think this makes a fundamental difference. That people using the mobile phone to find movies, people find using the mobile phone to search among their friends on Facebook, see which movies they like. Anybody here on Twitter? Yeah, Twitter? Yeah, it's okay, it's not, it's not bad. Twitter is a service, for example, where you can, I find all of my movies, my books, my music on Twitter. I've connected to all the people that I like, and I know there's at least 50 people who are absolute experts in movies and I find all my movies there. I find it for what's called a tribe, right? The tribe of people that I'm connecting with. I find all my stuff there. I don't need TV Guide or whatever we have here, right? To find movies or watch television. So the mobile is quickly becoming the universal remote control. If you imagine you have your contacts here, right? You may be doing the banking over this. You buy your bus tickets. And right? pretty soon you can buy a Coke or pay for parking. Uh, you also connect with your friends and they tell you where they are, so you can push a button and see them on the map, you know, Foursquare and those kind of things. So, what we have here is clearly a development towards mobile becoming the remote control for people's lives. And now we have the iPhone 4, another Apple, expensive Apple product. But it's interesting what happens now, it's been out for two weeks, and we already have movies made with the iPhone. And here's a movie called Apple of My Eye. I mean, for a mobile phone, this is pretty amazing. to think that what's happening here is not, we're not just changing the consumption, you know, how we, we also change the production. Right? And that's been clear for a long time. Right? Now, of course, the tools don't make a good movie, right? But see how they made this movie, it's quite interesting. Now, uh, this is a shot from how they made the movie. <laughs> Look at the camera. <laughs> that's your camera. Beginning to her reaction. And you can do the editing on the iPhone. It's taking me a little bit. I'm gonna get there. So a lot of people are saying, oh, this is really terrible because there's more and more and more movies all the time. Just like there's more and more music all the time because we have computers, right? I don't agree. I think when we have all these things happening, people are producing, first of all, they will love your movie much more because they know how much work it is. And they know how much time and work and effort goes into making a good movie when they've made their own. They also realize, for example, when you blog or when you make a movie, that you aren't a writer. Right? You're just not good enough. Right? So it makes you realize, yeah, you made your own movie, it doesn't mean you're going to be the next big producer. Right? It, it just means you have more appreciation for the real work. So to me, that's not a problem. I think that is actually a very good development. Right? Because if people are interested in movies, they make their own movies, they'll be sure to show up in one of your movies one of these days because they think that they should see the real thing. So I do a lot of work on the internet, right? But clearly, the internet isn't going to save, in parenthesis, us from all the evils. Uh, it isn't going to solve the problems that we have. I mean, as a, uh, I used to be a musician. I made 20 records, I wrote four books. I, the problem for all creative work is the same. We need to find an audience, we need to build the audience, and then they have to buy something from us. So we have to get some money out, right? So we have to also develop stories, which is a different story. Right? But if we want to make a living, we have to have a big audience, as big as possible, or a good small audience. Right? We have to groom, the, we have to have trust from the audience, and then we have to turn it into money. 
So the internet isn't changing this. The internet makes it easier for us to build the audience. That's the most powerful part of the internet. Right? We can team up with people, we can find people, they can find us. We can make more noise if we want to. We can be found out. Right? The bad thing about the internet, of course, is for one thing, we can't lie. Right? It's almost impossible to lie. Because if people find out, if I put on the internet that I played a gig with the Rolling Stones, it would take you two seconds to figure out I'm lying. Right? If I told you I made a fantastic movie, and I put it on Blip or YouTube, and you watch five seconds of this total shit, and you would lie. You know, you know I lied. Right? It's very easy to find out if it's real or not. If you're on LinkedIn, or Facebook, or Zing, or Twitter, you can pretty much tell what I do. It takes about 20 seconds. It's very difficult to say that I'm good, but I'm not on the internet. So yes, people are lying very successfully on the internet, of course, schemes and those kind of things. Right? But for the average person, it's pretty hard. So the internet is not a rose garden. It's not that magic wand. Okay, you, forget, you can forget that. It's, but it's basically fundamentally leveling the playing field. That's true for music, for films, for writing. Leveling the playing field means you have access to the market. Because guess what? You don't need major TV distribution. It would be nice to have it, of course. You don't need what you used to need to get anywhere. When I was a musician, I made uh, 20 records, as I said before. You did not have a career without a record deal with Sony, Warner, EMI, or Universal. It just didn't happen. Today is, has changed. It's not entirely different, but it has changed to some degree. You can go direct, and I'll have a few slides on how that works today. Ten years ago, right, in television, cable, the studios, and the networks ruled. Right? I mean, this is this is what our parents were used to, right? I mean, very straightforward. The world. world. The lead to other worlds. Mass media, right? On the internet, the users and their amplifiers rule. At least. In theory, we feel a lot more empowered on the internet than we talk with cable television. You can't go to cable television and say, I want to see the Sundance channel now. Right? You can do that on the internet. You can go to tech.com and see speeches. You can go to thousands of on-demand channels on the web. Fora TV, Big Thing, and many other things. Right? Look what's happening on the web already. The giants of content, the big studios, if people are watching video on the internet, what do they watch? Right, check it out here. CBS, Turner, Viacom, Fox. 1% and less of the total audience is by these people, is handled by these people. People are watching almost 37% YouTube and Google derived videos. Out of which many, of course, are copies of those. Right? But it's about 70% of the material on YouTube that's not taken from any of these guys. It's our stuff. I have, for example, many videos and in the aggregate, there's hundreds of thousands of people publishing. The problem is, of course, we don't know how we get paid from YouTube, right? <laughs> that's a big point, right? But in terms of the audience, all of a sudden the audience online is different because they have the choice. When you go to a movie theater, in many cases, you don't get to choose what place. I mean, it's just the program, obviously. Right? When you have cable TV, you don't get to choose what place. They choose what place. You can record it. Right? On the internet, this is why Google is starting Google TV. It was announced three weeks ago. Google TV allows you to sit in your living room and browse the entire web in one box on Google, where you can find every filmmaker, every movie, every short, archive, rated, indexed, most of it for free or subscribe, for example, for the networks like Hulu and Netflix. So in this world, we're much better off because most of us are not the stars and the hits. I mean, that's the reality of production, right? Most of us are not famous producers, actors, musicians. Because if you are really successful, then you just find down here, right? The CBS and whatever you've got. Right? But 99.5% of the people who produce interesting stuff, they don't get to be a hit. So we're much better off here. 
The question of how we return the money, of course, is a question we should talk about a little bit later. So, in a way, it's like this, right? I mean, the a lot of the major television producers and TV companies and film companies, which are my clients, to a large degree, all over the world, that's what they do, right? They're happily surfing, and there's a hurricane coming. Right? They know it's coming, but they like to surf, right? So they continue what they've always done, right? And this hurricane is mobile, social, cheap, and fast broadband internet access. Internet will become so cheap that many of us in two or three years won't even know if we're online or offline. It'll be a mental thing. Right? Just a mental switch, not a technology switch. So that means watching movies any way you want, on the go, in the car, in the subway, as you can already do that, that's basically already happening around the world. This will change a lot of things. This is one thing that will change. Some of you may have written the book called The Long Tail or read the book called The Long Tail, Chris Anderson wrote it. So this is one of the central points that we're seeing because of what I call the internet culture, the broadband culture, which is not pretty much the culture anyway. This used to be the deal, right? If you made a movie, you did not have distribution, nobody would find you. Just like a record, you make a record, you don't go in the store, you're dead. Right? You could sell it on your gig, so nobody wants a movie, then it just would never show up here. So this is no longer the problem. Because all of a sudden we have movies everywhere. On-demand services, free stuff, uh, edits on YouTube, all kinds of things, websites, HTML5, whatever you have, I mean, it's basically exploding. Now our problem is no longer distribution. Our problem is attention. The real problem for creative people that make things is attention. That's the main problem. The problem isn't money. So don't be fooled by discussions about people uh, you know, not wanting to pay on the internet. That's of course not true. There's about two billion dollars a year spent on dating on the internet. You know, finding women and things, men, dating. Two billion. There's six billion dollars spent a year on virtual goods, you know, sending flowers through Facebook, buying a tractor on Farmville, you know, whatever you have. Six billion dollars. I mean, people are spending money like crazy on the internet. So the question isn't about us getting their money. That can be a problem, of course. But the problem is really to get and keep and convert the attention. I think all of you know, if you ever play in a band, if you don't have a gig with an audience, you just don't exist. Right? If you can't fill the room with people, you're not going to sell any records. Right? The first thing to do is to get attention. And that on the internet can be pretty tough because there's so much noise. And right? there's so many things. And so that's one of the things I want to talk about as well. What's happening today in today's world, especially here in Switzerland, Switzerland, by the way, is number four worldwide in the level of technology that's being used. Number four. So it's very technologized, at the same time we have very traditional habits in Switzerland, as I'm sure you're aware of as well. So we have both. So it used to be my parents, your parents maybe, they lived by this, right? Whatever I can get. So if you want to watch Kojak, you know you watch at 8.15, that's what you get. You can't watch at 10. It's whatever you can get. Five years ago, my kids would download from the internet whatever movie was the first top 10 on BitTorrent. Right? Or the first 1,000 songs on LimeWire, just download all of them. Right? Whatever they can get, they wouldn't even know who the people are of the movie. Just download it. This has completely changed. People don't even download and steal your movies anymore if you don't get their attention. It goes like this, it's basically a funnel, right? Exactly what, how, and where I want. Right? This is basically what's happening now in media, is that everybody is switching to this. I want to know exactly, my friends have told me about this cool movie from Switzerland, where do I get it? Where can I see it? How do I find out more? And this will be a drastic shift to what I call fragmentation. Why in the world would we, would we watch 
a TV show on Swiss television if we weren't 100% interested? Well, five years ago, there was nothing else to watch. Uh, we'd have to pick from one of the channels. Right? Today, in my living room, we've got eight options of watching. All different options of doing, and this is going to become a standard. So unless you're a hit producer, or Mark Foster, or any of those people, this is good for you. Right? Because you get more of an audience, more of a chance. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the reality check, of course, is I want to give you a reality check, because the internet, again, doesn't fix these problems. Right? The reality check is we need both. We need to have the large scale networks, the large distribution, if we can get it, in the network. Right? We need both. If you have a crack at selling your movie into a major distribution, you should probably do it. And I've done it with two of my books. One was a bestseller, and it was great, but with my third book, I've downloaded over one million free copies, right? and I've made about $10,000 from donations, which is more than with my first book with the publisher that supposedly paid me for the best dinner. So, it all depends. I'm not saying it's either or, it's probably both. But uh, if you can't get a major studio to be interested in releasing your film, you can go to the network. You can get attention on the web, and this is a really good way of doing this, right? A lot of people are really worried about this. Filmmakers go on direct. I want to give you some examples of what's happening around the world, because I want to encourage you to check it out to see what's happening around the world. And by the way, because I'm not a film expert, I used a guy called Brian Newman, that you may know. He runs a, a company called Springboard Films, and he gave me some good advice on how to get this across to you. You guys know this? TED.com? Okay. TED.com is a conference, and they publish all the smart videos of those people that spoke there, all the best videos. So. TED.com is now the biggest site, the biggest distributor, of this kind of video in the world. 150 million views of these videos. TED.com is a conference, they're not even a TV channel. They're not a producer, and they make conferences. That's it. They are now the biggest provider of these kind of talks, inspirational speeches, presentations in the world. So all of a sudden, these people have an audience. If you're successful, they can get 500,000 views of your presentation and your pitch. So going direct is becoming a real option now. Here's a company called Naked Wines. If you're into wine, you'll love this one. Only works in England. You can go to nakedwines.com and say, okay, I'm interested in sponsoring a winemaker. There's 27 winemakers, I think, around the world. You can give 100 pounds to them, and they'll make the wine, and you'll be the first to get the new bottle. So you actually fund the creation of the wine before they make it. You develop a personal relationship with a very successful company that's exploding right now. So you get to buy the wine for 30 euros or so rather than 100 because you're an investor. So this is like winemakers going direct. So rather than going to the bank to get the money to make the wine, they go to Naked Wines. Right? And they raise the money for production. Crowd control, see, have you seen this? Crowd control is a place where you can say, I made a movie, you publish a preview of the movie if you want, and then you have people say where they want to see the movie. So they can use this tool as a Google Maps tool, it's an API, to actually say, I request the movie to be shown in Beale, or wherever it is, right? And then if there's enough, then you can figure out a schedule for screenings based on this technology tool. Right, so this saves you the trouble of figuring out where to go for screenings. Here's a, a, a site called Kickstarter. Kickstarter raises money for films. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Right? And it works. Didn't work so well with music. A site called Celebate. But Kickstarter allows you to put a clip online, a description, and raise money from your fans. So it's called crowdfunding. Right? It's basically, if you have an audience that likes your movies, they can contribute funds here, like this movie about DeLorean, DeLorean Hovercraft, right? Has 82 investors, right? and has $2,000 raised, and that's obviously not a whole lot for a movie. It's still very early. 
But now because of the internet, I mean, look at the simple fact, for example, Facebook. Uh, you guys are on Facebook, I'm, I'm sure. I'm G. Leonhardt, by the way. If you want to connect, let me know you're coming from this. I know who you are. So on Facebook, 10.5 billion minutes a day are spent on Facebook. Every 10th person in Switzerland is on Facebook. Imagine what would happen if you take your Facebook friends and you would say, go to this website, I need 50 francs from you to make my next movie. If you have that many fans, if they are really like you, if you've gotten their attention, you can raise some money. In many cases it doesn't work because your audience isn't big enough. But the possibilities of the web here are quite astounding. So it's still very early. Obviously, we need more time and a bigger audience to do this. And we thought about this at the late 90s, but it's finally happening right now. Google is putting up satellites with a company called O3B, the other 3 billion. They're putting up satellites all over the world to provide free internet access for people in Brazil, Russia, India, and China, roughly 3 billion people. And they're going up now, and the last one will be deployed at the end of the year. So as of next year, a lot of these people will have free internet access. Maybe you can get some of those three billion people interested in your movie using the internet. Maybe you can even get them to pay in some sort of way to pay, not just with money. And basically what we see here is that because diversity goes up, control goes down. This is one of the things that we have to face on the internet. We can't build an audience and completely control it. It's like going to somebody's house for dinner and saying, you know, I do not want you to cook this. Basically, what happens on the web, you have to give something to get something. Well, it's really always been true. But on the web, it makes extreme form. So, giving up some control and giving away stuff, right, that is the most powerful mechanism on the web that I should talk about. And before I talk about that, right, we have a lot of debate in Europe about piracy. Not so much in Switzerland, really, but we do have some of that here, too. So, don't be fooled. For the most part, piracy is just market failure. And if I'm downloading music for free, why am I doing this? Because I want to screw the artists? Maybe I want to screw the labels, I will understand that. But what is the motivation behind it? The motivation, most of the time, is I can't get it anywhere else. I don't like the price, I don't like the service, I don't like the deal. If I go to iTunes here in Switzerland, I'm looking to rent a movie, what happens? 9 out of 10 not available in Switzerland. Who makes those rules? Forcing us to go somewhere else to buy the movie. So basically what's happening is that because we have demand in the market, right, people are downloading, getting things for free from books to music, to movies because it's not being served in the way that the user wants. 95% of people around the world, if you talk to them about stealing music, you know what they say? Say, I'd be happy to pay if I could. Uh, if the deal was right, if the money was right, if I could afford it, uh, if it was done in a way that works. So that makes a big difference. I spoke at this event in 2008 in, uh, in Austria and really what's shaping up now is a new cultural economy. It's a new logic. It's a new way of how we come up with ideas about how we get paid. This is your big chance as a producer, if you're a creator. This, right? The chance is not to say, well, you know, everybody who downloads for free right, is a criminal. So, anyway, the good news here is that we found out, there's been lots of research about this, on the internet, which roughly about, I would say, realistically speaking, about maybe one billion people who have the enough bandwidth, the viewers are completely different. The habits of what people watch are completely different than cable television or cinemas or mainstream productions. Basically what's happening is, for example, on Facebook, right, last month, 150 billion videos watched on Facebook. If you haven't published a movie on Facebook, you're making a big mistake. Right? Because that's the audience. Again, as I was saying earlier, it's not about asking them to pay. It's about building your audience 
that they will eventually be able to make a payment to you in some sort of way or the other. Because online viewers are so different, you know, we have, of course, a big effect, which is good for the most of us, that the niches are gaining. The stuff that's less for the masses actually rises. And that's simply because, uh, think of restaurants, you know, 20 years ago, if you go to London, all you could eat was fish and chips and pizza. Maybe a Greek place. And so you would go and have pizza. Today, you go to London, you have every possible choice in the universe to eat. Will you still eat pizza? Most people will not. You can still go have pizza sometimes, but you're diversified. Right? We have completely fragmented. So in London, it has resulted in a very active scene of wanting to be different. Right? Not always going for the same. If you look at travel, what's happening in the travel business, right? The red line is the line that says, I'm going everywhere else but the main destinations, you know, Bali, Thailand, whatever. People are completely diversifying where they travel. If you look at this trend, right? Because on the web, they can find out. They can try stuff. Same is true for motion pictures. Here's, for example, what kind of online video have you watched last month? The red line, 2008, unfortunately, a little bit old, but it says 64% of people have watched the user-made videos, not the mainstream stuff. That's good news for us, because that's how we have a chance to get watched by people. There's a store called Etsy that sells only handmade products. Last year, they sold 250 million dollars worth of stuff, like gloves and, you know, pe that people make by hand and, and sell through Etsy, right? Complete niche stuff. So this is the future. We're all the same, but we're also different. <clears throat> so we're no longer going to be forced to necessarily watch what we don't want to watch. We'll have more options, which means that in the end, if you're a producer that produces just this, you know, horror movies or whatever, right? You have a chance as well. So that all sounds really good, but of course then there's the question, you know, how do you turn that into a living, right? So basically in this sort of system, this is the most important part, right? Having a tribe, having a connection of people who support what you do. So people who talk about your stuff, people who send the link on, uh, I would say that probably most people in this room have sent a link from a YouTube video. Right? Everybody here, if you use YouTube, you, you see a video you like, what do you do? Say, so send this to my friends. 78% right? of all the entire traffic of YouTube is the links. Right? It's not people making an ad saying, watch YouTube. It's us sending the links. That's how this works. That's how you build the audience. So when you build the audience, then you can do this, you know, create a network of people who will support what you do. Now, let's talk about money. Not that I'm an expert in money, but... Okay, in three years, you'll be able to pay your rent with Facebook. You think it's funny, yes? Yeah? I think it's funny as well. My landlord will take it today, I think, if I offered it to him. But Facebook will offer a way for us to make money. You know how they will do this? They will generate money by people who like other people's stuff on Facebook. Today when you go to Facebook, you, you click a button that says I like, right? You, you've seen the button, right? Like. It's everywhere on the internet now. And this button generates credibility, reputation. So when you come to my website and you only see two likes buttons, and you're like, you know, this guy isn't very popular. There, there may be a technical problem, right? Who knows? But, so when you see the like button goes up, you have a bit of a rating, like eBay. Right? So you can see people have liked it a lot. So I bet you money, when you come to a website where there's lots of movies, and you can watch, you know, lots, lots of independent movie websites to watch, you're going to click the one first that has the highest rating. The biggest thumbs up, the biggest Twitter followers, you know, all these things, right? So Facebook is creating a currency to wear out of the popularity that you have for your movies, for your blog posts, for your pictures, for your videos. People would put money into a pot. For example, it's not too far-fetched to say, okay, I'm going to give Facebook 10 Swiss francs a year. And I will put the like button, every time I hit the like button, 
a piece of my 10 francs, depending on how many buttons I hit, goes into the pot of that person. So we're paying each other through Facebook. And this system is coming. This system allows me to say I'm putting some money in the bank, I'm also getting paid. Lots of people like my presentations. I have about 50 videos on Facebook. I'm waiting for this. So I can buy a new car. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I think it will take some time. But think about this, right? 550 million people on Facebook. Every sixth minute on, in the world is spent on Facebook. When this goes into place, right, we can say, okay, if you like my stuff, hit the like button. When you hit the like button, I get a piece of your money stream. And I can buy other things on Facebook. So I can go to my landlord my, and say, okay, take my Facebook credits for my production. There's a company called Flatter. It's doing a similar thing. It's a button you put on your website, and you can be flattered. You can be paid money that people put in the bank. And you can pay with a tweet. Right? This, of course, not real money. But paywithatweet.com allows you to say, while well, you're putting up your book or your movie, and anybody who tweets gets a free copy. Now, because we live in Switzerland, we shouldn't just be talking about plain money. Right? We shouldn't be talking about just dollars or real money. Because money and getting paid is a whole different thing. This is a chart from Ovum, which is a great research company. Right? Today, we think about money as this, right? We pay to get this. But the future of money is going to be virtual currencies, paying with data, attention, which is advertising, and influence. I get an email every single day from some company saying, would you please tweet about what we do? We'll pay you $100, $500, $1,000. They want to pay me to mention them. Because which I don't do by principle. You know, I would probably do it for a million. Or so if you want to offer me a million, you think about it. But in principle, I don't do this. Right? But this becomes a currency. Right? The value that you have in your network becomes real money. You can raise the money, you can distribute the money. If you want to make a new movie, you can use that social capital to raise the money. That's going to be a future perspective, I think, quite interesting. So, um, basically, what's happening around the web, if you're looking at this, is US audience, right? The people that are watching online videos are exploding. I think, of course, all of us are doing this. So clearly what's happening is that access to content will replace buying a copy. In other words, DVD purchases are declining. You know this, I'm sure, at least in most countries. CD purchases are tanking. And CDs and books as well. And newspapers. What is increasing is everybody wants to go online to do interesting stuff. I buy online access, buy new devices, buy subscriptions, and of course, if you have an iPhone, anybody with an iPhone here? If you have an iPhone, you know this, you buy those damn applications, right? Those, whatever they are, you know, three dollars for this, or four, four francs for this, let know you get mine for free. But for the most part, you know, we're buying these things, we're buying, for example, a iPhone application that helps you to get divorced. That's four dollars. And there's like a hundred of them. Like a guide, you know, you can do step by step guide. People buy the average iPhone user buys four dollars of stuff a month. So when we think about selling our movies, can we sell them on an iPhone? I think we can. If we have enough of an audience, maybe you by yourself, of course, that may be hard. But together in a group, in a channel, like Netflix, that sounds reasonable to me. So really what's happening here is that once we have the attention, we have to really think about that it's no longer the copy that's so valuable. Right? It's all the other stuff, the timing, the attention, the relevance, the context, all the other stuff. And people pay for this. They pay for you to say, this is authentic. This was released yesterday. This is a special edition. Right? This is the perceived value that your movie has or your production has. So, you know, we live in this world, of course, you, all of us know this. I mean, basically, it used to be five TV stations, and now we've got 50 on cable, maybe 100, and we've got another 250,000 on the, on the internet, right? So very soon, any possible channel, you want to see about erotic massages, you can watch it all day long, 
right? You can see about motorcycle fixing all day long, the Discovery Channel, whatever, whatever you want to see, we'll be there. So the question is, when there's so much happening, how do you get people to listen to you? How do you do that? How do you get them, get them to be sucked in? Right? So a lot of people in the movie industry, the MPAA and the big studios, they think it's a, it's a war. Right? It's a war for money. Because when we stop buying the old way, we deflate the model, right? We kill the model just like the music industry. But of course, that's not true. The real war, it's not for money, it's for attention. That's really what we're talking about here. So if you want to distribute something, if you want to get your stuff to be heard, right, it's this, right? You have to find a way to turn the switch to on. To have people talking about you, spreading the word, sending out stuff, posting comments, writing about you on Wikipedia. The other day, somebody put a Portuguese and a French description of what I do on Wikipedia. Right? Just, I don't know why. Somebody returned the favor because I gave them a book for free or whatever the deal is, right? Give you something back. It's all about attention. And attention comes from conversation. So if you're making a movie, if you're in a band, if you're writing a book, you have to have a conversation with people that will like it. Right? Many successful books like The Long Tail or Free or others came out of the conversation with people. They were actually sort of co-written by people. So having a conversation using Twitter, a blog, Facebook, YouTube, whatever you're using, having a conversation, being personal, building your tribe. I mean, if you're a filmmaker or a producer, you have to have a tribe. A tribe of people who support what you do, that are interested, that help you, that may donate money, that may connect you with others. I mean, that's basically what it's all about. When you give something, for example, now on Flickr, you guys know Flickr, right? I'm sure. And Flickr is the most amazing place for photos and finding stuff. Basically now, every band, every writer, every author, every filmmaker, publishing a whole series of, of, of shots on the web to see how this movie was made. To see the background, to see the crew, to see... People want to see this. If, you don't, if you're making a movie, you're not using Flickr to publish stuff, right? You're missing a big audience. Because when the audience uh, sees what it looks like behind the scenes, right, they develop some trust. They basically get involved. Right? Kevin Kelly, who founded Wired Magazine, he says, wherever attention flows, money will follow. And this is not some California bullshit. Okay? A lot of people are saying this is just, you know, it's, it's a tale. You know? It's not true. This is actually very capitalist. Right? Because the reverse is also true, no attention, no money. And it's very hard to get attention these days. And so you should place a lot of attention on getting attention and then think about the conversion. Right? Part of that means is you have to open up the conversation. Many of you may know the musician John Mayer, you know, rock musician, uh, slightly more successful than I was, even though he's also a guitar player. Um, Two, he has 3.2 million followers on Twitter. 3.2 million people are tracking what he's doing on Twitter. Right? Most amazing uh, story there. That's how he gets attention by being open. I'm going to skip ahead because otherwise we'll be here tomorrow morning. So, um, okay, here's some people you may know. If you're not Twittering as a filmmaker, do it now. Okay. This is how you create a huge channel of flow of people who are interested. Every day I discover another interesting person on Twitter, and maybe they discover me. This is a process that's basically like microblogging, right? publishing things. Ted Hope, great producer, has a Twitter channel. David Lynch has a Twitter channel. And believe it or not, you can send messages to those people and they respond. Maybe not David though, no, somebody else. You can actually find people, you send them a message saying, hey, I'm going to be in LA, do you want to have coffee? Maybe not David again. But other people, okay. These, I don't know who he is, but this is stuff I found. David Wayne, maybe you guys know him. Robert Ardizzi, uh, and here's myself. So basically, Twitter allows you to build this channel to fish where the fish are. Right? The fish today are your audience, it's all over the web. 
If you're not using this, you might, you're, you're missing a big opportunity there. Also for developing stories. Uh, people actually send you stuff and say, hey, how about this? This would be a good topic. Or attaching an image, or showing you a location. Uh, this stuff happens all the time. So social network and the numbers are absolutely huge. Uh, this is a huge vehicle of distribution opportunity. They are the new distributors. These people are the people who are going to say, watch this movie. You can download it here for free, for paid, or part of the service, or whatever, sending a link. But what you want people to do is to say to all of their friends, you've got to see this movie. By sending a link, or a tweet, or a blog post, or Facebook. So the disconnection that we've had in the movie industry with the audience, you know, we have to recollect this very important part. We're going to take some short questions very soon, so let me just wrap this up. And you guys can prepare for questions in English or German or whatever you have. Unfortunately, time's a little bit short. So what we can learn from Twitter, even if you don't like tweeting, if you don't like the noise or the time wasting, right? But let me warn you about this. If you don't want to waste time, you'll never get anywhere. Right? That's the nature of the whole thing. What's happening on Twitter is that the paradigm of following, that's a very powerful tool if you're in this business. Right? You don't want people to buy from you. You want them to become addicted. Right? Addicted to what you're doing, what you're saying, what you're creating, what you're selling, because they will always give you money. When, I mean, it's a drug model, basically. Right? So from pushing to pulling, like the Huffington Post, the world's most successful blog, right, has beaten the traffic of CNN with this model, right, with a followship model. So that's the model how we generate income. Last year, I think they made over $100 million in revenue, right, and they have 40 people. So this whole debate of free versus paid, right, it's a bit of an artificial debate because Bottom line is, you know, I, I work with a guy called uh, Mike Mesnick from Tech Dirt. That's what he says about how to get paid. Connect with fans, give them reason to buy. That's how you get paid. Right? That's all there is to it. Right? If you don't connect with your audience and other people who may like what you do, you'll never get paid. You can't ask people to pay that don't know you. Right? So the first step is connect with the fans and give them reason to buy. Um, so this graph also shows it quite nicely. Now a fan is a person who does this. Right? That's first. And the consumer is this. Right? Don't confuse the order. Right? A person who buys something as a customer is not the same as a fan. Right? You need lots of these first. Uh, Kevin Kelly has spoken about this. He says a thousand fans. If you have a thousand true fans, and I would say it probably starts at about 150. Because 150 is what we traditionally call the tribe, the number of people that are close to you. So if you have 150 people who support what you do, regardless of what it is, and then you can enlarge that to 1,000 fans, right, then this model becomes a model to where you can bank on. 1,000 right? true fans. Okay. Now, get ready for your questions. If I haven't answered all of your questions already. Okay, two minutes and we'll get a question. So let's redefine what's important in what I call film 2.0, the future of filmmaking and cinema. Let's redefine what's important, right? The content, what you do, is not everything that matters. It's very important, but it's not everything. In the old movie industry, we, th we thought, okay, we make a movie, we try to get distribution, we sell it, we license it, you know, content is everything. You know, content is king. And that's still true, right? But on, what's happening on the web, all of a sudden we're realizing it's also about the community. It's about how people forward, how they share, how much they comment, how much they tell others, how many remixes they make of your movie, how many parodies they make from your movie, how they spread the word, that increases the value. If you have no community, you have great content, you're still dead. Today, the biggest community drives the content and vice versa, and then of course you have connectivity and context. Right timing, right place, right device, maybe on the mobile phone, maybe on the iPad, by right? creating an easy way. And this goes for paying too. If you put your movie on a website, 
and you say, okay, download my movie, it's uh, three Swiss francs, that won't work. Right? That won't work for most people because you don't have this or you don't have this. I mean, to pay three francs to you, what do I have to do to pay three francs? I have to use PayPal or the bank or, you know, it's complicated. And I don't know who you are. So this is why it doesn't work. But if you're part of a channel like Netflix, and there's 40, 50, 100 million people subscribing to the channel, and you get some placement because the community says this is a great movie from Switzerland in Netflix, right? then the payment is already there. So that's something to think about, how you get paid and how you work out the, the mechanism. Okay, so, une question, a question. Yes, <laughs> good question. Twitter is a lot like Google, right? Twitter was created because it was a need. The need was to have short conversations, and later, you know, initially it was the idea of what, you, what are you doing, right? But have to share things, like a blog, right? When you do a blog post, you write a story, other people can read it. On Twitter, it's instant, right? To create a network of people who are sharing things. Um, the best thing on Twitter to do is really quite simple. You pick a topic. You pick, for example, the topic of your movie. Let's say, tribes in Zimbabwe, whatever the story is, right? You Twitter about that. You become an expert in that conversation, right? On my Twitter feed, which is G. Leonhard, I only talk about the future of content, technology, all the stuff I talk about. I don't talk about my kids or what I'm drinking. I have other channels for that. I have several Twitter accounts, right? But, so you make a brand, right? Because people are really interested in a quick fix on Twitter. And when they like your quick fixes, then they go deeper. About, uh, my blog traffic has increased the last three years by almost 1,000%. Entirely because of Twitter. Because what happens on Twitter, people read a headline saying the future of radio or something, right? And they find it interesting, they maybe see an image, and then they click to my website. From the website, they click to my TV channel, which is called Gertube, like YouTube. Gertube.net is, is my TV channel. They click on the TV channel, and then from there, they click to iTunes to download the whole 200 hours. And what happens after that? And then they say, we have to talk to Gert to come to speak to us about something. Right? So most of my work is think tanks and workshops and so on. Right? That's how it works. So on Twitter, it's best to find a format, a persona. And I would say most people are very specific about what they write about. They write about what they do, their skills, or their topic, the next movie. Of course, if you're already a VIP like David Lynch, you know, you can write about anything. You have 400,000 followers. You know. But that's very important. Right? So in a way, and this is why I put up this image when you said Twitter, you know, in a way, the people who are doing this on Twitter, they have so much power now over a lot of things. Right? There's companies now going to Twitter and before they need you to distribute your movie or talk about your next production, they go to Twitter, search.twitter.com to see if people are talking about you in real time. I've been at meetings when it was about doing something together, a creative project where they go to the search engine on Twitter and they look to see if you're mentioned. And if you're not mentioned, they're not interested because you don't have an audience. So it's a little bit like, it's like Google the next level. Right? And how Twitter makes money, well, with 150 million people using it, how Twitter makes money, there'll be many ways they can make money. It's exactly like Google, right? I mean, Google is discovering that they can put those tiny boxes in the search called AdWords. Right? They discovered that by accident. Somebody sent an email. Today, it's $2.7 billion a month from the AdWords. I'm running ads on AdWords. So 2.7 billion a month from this discovery. So you can bet that Twitter will make a boatload of money when they discover what they can do there. Same goes for Facebook. Right? I mean, the Facebook audience is the biggest broadcaster in the world. Bigger than the BBC, bigger than CNN, HBO, whatever. And it's the biggest broadcaster in the world. 
So it's the biggest place to potentially distribute your movies. So I think in the next two or three years, we'll probably see a combination of Facebook and Netflix. So you'll use your money from, that, from Facebook to pay and you'll get television built into Facebook. So those kind of things will be great for us because for the first time we'll have a big global distribution channel. The only battle, as I was saying earlier, the real battle is about getting attention and having a good story. If your story sucks, it will be immediately obvious. Right? That's what happens in the web. So I would focus on those two things if, uh, if you're into creating a career on this. You know, good stories and the quality of what you do and of course generating the attention, keeping the attention and building the audience. That's sort of a nutshell. I think we have to close very soon, so do I have one more question or two more questions? Anyone? No? Yes? Okay. Is there a way that we can put a dollar value behind our social network and yep. say that um, for everyone that thinks I'm cool, can I tell an investor, 100,000 people think I'm cool, hence I'm worth $100,000? Absolutely, and I have a slide for that too. <laughs> okay, can you give us a quote on that? Yes, I can. But of course, it's a bit of an art, you know. Basically, you see at Starbucks, for example, right? Starbucks makes a great example here. Starbucks has 7.7 .7 million Facebook users. Now, they have, I mean, friends, Facebook friends, right? I hate Starbucks coffee, let's be clear about that. It's terrible coffee. But I use Starbucks all the time in that travel because they have Wi Fi. Right? So, it's not about the coffee, right? You realize Starbucks is not about the coffee. Right? It's about everything but the coffee. <laughs> That's true. They built a fantastic brand, and the coffee is just where it starts. Right? That's so. Anyway, 7.7 .7 million people on Facebook connected to Starbucks. It turns out they they spend an average of 159 dollars more than people who are not friends on Facebook. That means that means that people who are connected to the brand actually spend money in the store buying coffee a lot more than those who are not. So it's now becoming pretty much a proof among big brands and companies and people that if you have friends, uh, Facebook followers or friends or Twitter followers, they become worth money in the bank. You have to figure out what the formula of calculation is. Right? With Starbucks it's easy. Right? Because you, could, you, you know who they are when they show up with the Starbucks card and all these things. Right? With us, you know, when you do creative things on Facebook, you can figure out pretty much, for example, what I do is if I have a new book, I send a message to everyone, and 8% click on the message, and 2% buy, that's my money value, if, if you want to see it this way. But it's a, it's a little bit difficult, because sometimes you don't know if you've asked the wrong question, or you've given them the wrong link, or they couldn't pay because we're in Afghanistan or whatever, you know. I mean, there's lots of reasons for this, right? But clearly, every single follower or friend that you have on social networks is money in the bank. Right? But of course, that goes for the qualified ones. Right? So you should be a little bit picky about who you connect with. Right? Uh, the key on Facebook and Twitter is to be real, right? To be honest and to be real and to add value, not to provide bullshit. Right? And that's especially true on Twitter because I think it's about 90% of people on Twitter tweet only once and never again. So, you know, keep that in mind. It's, it, you have to be very real and targeted to actually get it back. I think we have to stop now. Huh? We'll talk forever. Anyway, mediafuturist.com is where you download my, my presentation. Uh, if you want the free book, Fiction is Fiction, just Twitter me at gleonhart. But be sure to follow first, otherwise I can't send you the link. The link is not public. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>